Good morning. The Lord be with you. Wonderful to welcome you in worship on the fourth Sunday of Easter. If you're not a member of our church family, but you're looking for a welcoming and loving church family, we hope you'll give Westminster a try. For those of you who are online this morning, we hope you'll download the bulletin from the watch page of our website. We have two Zoom Bible studies. One is on Wednesdays at noon, the other Thursdays at six. Supporting Guatemalans in Kennett Square. That's the topic for this morning's adult education class down in classroom six at 1010. See, I believe Mary Hughes is with us this morning. Mary, thank you for being with us. We look forward to your presentation. That's downstairs in classroom six at 1010. Redefining public safety, interrupting violence in our city. That's the topic for Thursday night's education class on Zoom. That's the topic, and Deborah Mason will be the presenter. There's more information on page seven. Today's flowers are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Donna Shaw by her family. The rose next to the pulpit celebrates the birth of Kennedy Peter Foley, he is the grandson of John and Barbara Carpenter and Barbara and Carl Omot. Congratulations. Well, grandson and great-grandson, I should say. That's why they're smiling. They don't have to get up in the middle of the night. <laughs> the Westminster Bazaar was a great success. We appreciate everyone who volunteered, everyone who brought items, and everyone who bought items. You know that everything that we receive there goes to local and global missions that we support. We owe a special debt of gratitude for Susan Williamson who coordinated that event. Susan, thank you. <laughs> Susan was here so much last week, I thought we were gonna have to put her on paid staff. Does anyone need to catch a train immediately after worship? Well, good then I'd like for you to go to Grace Hall after worship. We've set up Holy Toast Cafe down in Grace Hall. We still have a number of items that were left over from the bazaar. So we'd like for you to go down there. If you see something that you or someone you know could use, pick it up. And if you want to leave a contribution, that would be great. There'll be a box down there. You can do that. So there are books in Grace Hall in the hallway extending down to Walton Community Hall. There's artwork, and then the real treasures are down in classroom four. So I hope you'll check those out after worship, get some coffee and some snacks, and if you pick up something, maybe a donation. Please sign the friendship pads at the end of the pew and pass those down to everyone, sign those, and then take a look at who's sitting with you this morning so that you can welcome them following worship. I hope you'll especially look for people that you don't already know. Now we open our hearts, minds, and souls to the Spirit of God.
We do not live by bread alone. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a humble spirit. Christ calls us to abandon wayward wanderings and return to the caring arms of the one who safeguards our souls. Beginning with honest confession, let us respond to our shepherd's call. Let us pray. Gracious God, make us mindful of our overflowing blessings that we may experience the joy of a grateful heart. You have blessed us with numerous gifts, but we often forget to notice. We yearn to live abundant lives filled with gratitude, but we are so consumed by what we lack that we overlook what we have already received. Forgive our folly and redirect us to your way so that we follow Jesus with thanksgiving and generosity. Amen. With grace overflowing, Jesus frees us from sins that burden and shame that binds and liberates us to walk in the ways of justice and righteousness. For Christ came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Alleluia. Amen. At this time, I invite the children to come forward and join me on the chancel steps. Good morning. 
evening, everyone. It is so good to see you today. Today, I want to talk with you about a word that may be new to some of you. That word is abundance. Can you say that after me? Abundance. abundance. Good job. Does anyone know what abundance means? It means having a lot of something, a very large amount, maybe more than we need. So think about a table that is set for Thanksgiving dinner with lots of yummy food, turkey and sweet potatoes and rolls and cranberry sauce and all kinds of good stuff. Can you picture that table in your minds? Can you picture that? I can see you all picturing that. You're doing a good job focusing. So when we picture Thanksgiving dinner, we picture a lot of food. We picture an abundance of food. Or think about a rainy day, the kind of day when it just pours and pours and there's a stream of water in the road and there are puddles on the sidewalk. And on that kind of day, are you thinking about the kind of weekend we've had? Today is a little bit like that, yes. So on a day like that, we would say that we have an abundance of water. Is there anything else that comes to mind when you picture abundance? Can you think of any other examples? I think about, have you all ever been away from the city in a place where there's not a lot of lights and you look up at the sky at night and there's an abundance of stars. Have you ever seen a, a, a night sky that is so full of stars that it almost looks bright? That would be another example of abundance. There are lots of images that come to mind when we think about abundance. Well, Jesus also talks about abundance. In today's Bible lesson, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is talking about having a full life, a life that is full. What does that mean? Do you think Jesus is talking about a life that is full of stuff? No, I don't think so either. I think there are, other, there are things other than stuff that Jesus wants us to fill our lives with. What are you thinking? Jo that was going to be my first example. I think Jesus wants us to fill our lives with joy. I think Jesus wants us to fill our lives with love, things that we can't necessarily see, but that we can feel, things that make our lives better and that make the lives of other people better too. Can you think of other things that Jesus might want us to fill our lives with? Any other ideas? What about kindness? Do you think Jesus wants us to fill our lives with kindness? Yeah, so things like joy and love and kindness, these are all things that Jesus gives to us and that Jesus asks us to share with other people. And when we do that, it makes life special and full for us and for others. It makes life abundant. Let's say a prayer, and I'd like the whole congregation to join us in our echo prayer. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for sending Jesus, for sending Jesus to, show to show us the abundance of your love. Help us fill our lives with things like love, things like love. And, joy, and joy and kindness. And kindness. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me up here. I see Miss Alexis over there. You can follow her to Sunday school. Here's Miss Kathleen Chu. In today's passage from the Gospel of John, 
Jesus is addressing two different groups. One group is his followers. The other group, though, are adversaries who have come to undermine Jesus. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke narrate the story of Jesus, where he traveled, what he taught, who he healed. John took a different approach to his Gospel. He was focused on elucidating who Jesus is, and he employed figures of speech continuously to help us understand. Now, it doesn't take a seminary education to reach that conclusion. He tips us off in the very first sentence of his gospel when he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it doesn't end with the opening chapter. Throughout his gospel, John employed numerous metaphors to paint his portrait of Jesus. John knew that there was no one figure of speech that could capture the essence of the man from Nazareth. So he peppered his gospel with seven I am statements to help us grasp the completeness and complexity of Jesus. It's in John's gospel that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. But before we can completely unpack the meaning of that description, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. All right, we need to wrap our heads around bread and light. Got it. However, then Jesus says, I am the true vine. And then I am the resurrection and the life. And then I am the way and the truth and the life. And while we're still grappling with all these metaphors, today's passage serves up yet another. Jesus says, I am the gate. And then in the verse that immediately follows our passage, he says, I am the good shepherd. You simply cannot read the Gospel of John and turn Jesus into a cardboard cutout. He is a multi-dimensional figure, as multi-dimensional as we can imagine. Now, if you followed closely as I was reading the Scripture passage, you may have realized just how many metaphors John can cram into just a few verses. He provides us with sheep, sheepfold, shepherd, thieves, bandits, pasture, gate, and gatekeeper. Commenting on this multiplicity of metaphors, a colleague says, it's tempting to treat this section of Scripture as if it's written in some obscure code. It's our job to crack the secret. What exactly does the sheepfold represent? Is it heaven? Is it the church? Is it our hearts? Where or who are the thieves and the bandits? Are they different from the strangers? What about the gatekeeper? Is the gatekeeper God, or the Holy Spirit, or Jesus? Wait a minute, it can't be Jesus because he said, I am the gate, twice. Actually, how could he be the gate or the gatekeeper because he says, I am the shepherd? You see, it's tempting to dig so far down into the weeds that we become sidetracked. Now, the passage is obviously an echo of the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd. This was a powerful metaphor in an agrarian society where sheep and shepherds were commonplace. The question for us is, does it still resonate with 21st century North Americans many of whom have never even seen a shepherd. I think it still works. Jesus refers to himself as the shepherd and all of his followers as the sheep. And we know that sheep are vulnerable animals who need someone to protect and guide them. See, sheep can't simply survive on their own. 
They rely on someone to lead them to food and water and to protect them from predators. Jesus warns his followers to keep an eye out for those he refers to as thieves and bandits. However, it's not the warning that catches my attention. It's this odd metaphor he uses for himself. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, or I am the light of the world, or I am the resurrection and the life, we nod in agreement and smile. But our passage includes this peculiar I am statement. Jesus says, I am the gate. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I think a couple of things. First, we know that a gate is used for protection. The shepherd leads the sheep into a sheepfold, a large animal pen, and then closes the gate behind them so no predators can enter and attack. They can shelter in place whenever danger is nearby. However, closing off the outside is not the only function of a gate, is it? A gate is also the opening that allows one to leave a closed-in space in order to venture out into other pastures. A new idea might be a gate that opens your mind to a new understanding. Poet Mary Oliver writes, I have become older, and cherishing what I have learned, I have become younger. When we are imprisoned by guilt, Jesus opens the gate to forgiveness. When we are too wrapped up in ourselves, Jesus opens the gate to a life of service. One theologian says the most important single move that any person of faith can make is to escape the prison of self, the dungeon of self-absorption. Jesus frees us to a life of love. Jesus calls himself the gate and then tells us where this gate will lead us. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the gate that opens the door to an abundant life. These days, many are searching. They're searching for a rich and beautiful and soul-nourishing way of living. Are you genuinely grateful for the blessings you enjoy, or are you, the ex are you the victim of expectation creep? Does gratitude kindle in your chest deep feelings of joy, or does discontent keep driving you to chase after a higher and higher and higher standard of living? Each time you reach your expectations, do they creep just out of reach so that you're always striving toward an elusive goal? What really constitutes an abundant life? Well, it's characterized by many things. It's a life of gratitude one in which we are continuously giving thanks for the blessings of life. It's a life of purpose. We use our unique gifts to touch others in positive ways, and that not only buoys their lives, but it brings deep satisfaction to us. An abundant life is a life of generosity. Sharing our resources with others sparks joy in our lives. 
an abundant life welcomes the grace of God. We are not perfect. We do things we ought not do, and then we fail to do things we ought to do. We can wallow in guilt and try to elicit other people's pity, or we can accept the fact that we fall short of God's way and embrace God's grace. Then in accepting God's grace for ourselves, we can come to see that God's grace is incredibly expansive. God loves and forgives those that we have a difficult time loving. A colleague recalls a story her theology professor told in seminary. He was once attending a political rally in Atlanta. He said people were lined up on each side of the street, uh, street They were waving their placards and shouting slogans back and forth at each other. A man on one side of the debate walked across the street to the other side and engaged a woman in conversation. He asked her if she was saved. She said yes, she was, and that she was in fact very involved in her church. Then the man said, well, I just want you to know that You're going to hell for believing what you believe. The woman said, I look forward to eating at the table with you in the kingdom of heaven. After hearing those words, he looked her straight in the eye and said, Well, if you're in heaven, then I'm going to grab my hat and take the next train to hell. See, the man was so enraged by her claim that God's grace would include even her, someone with whom he vehemently disagreed, that he would rather choose condemnation than see that kind of grace lived out in eternity. To live an abundant life is to embrace rather than reject the expansive love of God. Now, many people assume that an abundant life is due primarily to one's circumstances in life. When life is beautiful and we have all and more than we need, when love is shared and the road we're traveling is smooth and straight, life is rich and rewarding. Such moments are truly precious, and we ought to fully embrace them. However, I don't think that fully captures what Jesus is talking about when he talks about an abundant life. An abundant life is also filled with grace and gratitude regardless of our circumstances. An abundant life can also be obtained when the road we travel is grueling and life is harsh. Reverend Dr. Darren Kennedy is a professor at the oldest Protestant seminary in the Middle East. Growing up, he was a member of Village Presbyterian Church in Kansas City. He recalls a young man named Paul Childs, who was his youth leader. He remembers that Paul was social and funny and athletic and a bit mischievous. He said that's what made him such a great junior high youth leader. Kennedy looked up to Paul. He was a model of the Christian life, and he felt God's love through Paul. Paul was also a competitive triathlete. And on September 7th, 1986, Paul was so far ahead in the bike stage of the race that a police officer waved a truck across the course. Paul came over a crest and rammed into the truck and died immediately. 
was a tragic accident with terrible consequences. 35 years later, Kennedy still carries the photo of Paul in his wallet. Well, Paul's parents were members of Village Church, and they did something astonishing in the midst of their crushing grief. They knew that what had happened was just an accident. There was no malice involved. They also knew that there was a good chance that feelings of guilt would destroy the people who were involved in that accident. It became unbearable for Paul's parents to think that Paul's life could have been lived so fully in love and grace only to torment others in his death. So they called one of the pastors of the church and said, could you please invite the police officer and the truck driver and the two race organizers over to our house for tea and lemon bars? The four went to the parents' home and they all wept together. They spoke of Paul, they spoke of forgiveness, they spoke of hope. The tragedy could have left Paul's parents bitter and resentful. It could have saddled the police officer and the truck driver and the race organizers with searing guilt. But because Paul's parents had a deep faith in the one who said, I am the gate, they opened the gate to healing and hope. Clearly, they knew something about what it means to live an abundant life. May each of us draw ever closer to the abundant life God urges us to live.
Friends, every good and perfect gift comes from above. So with gratitude, let us return to God the offering of our lives and the gifts of the earth.
in gratitude for what God has done and continues to do for us, we give ourselves in acts of service. Today it's our privilege to commission eight new Stephen ministers, six from our church family and two from other congregations. The eight have all joined together in the commissioning and the training that's been going on over the last few months. They've gone through 50 hours of Stephen minister training. I'd like for Jill Getty to come up and join me up front. This ministry, this vital ministry at our church could not happen without this person right here, and we owe her a debt of gratitude for that. <laughs> Stephen Ministry is just a wonderful service that we provide very quiet kind of ministry that goes on where people meet one-on-one -on -one and walk with someone while they're going through a difficult time in their lives. I also want to thank the Stephen leaders who helped in the training over these past few months. They are Ellie Furry, Jerry Spilecki, Janet Steinwedel, and Sue Weisinger. The following people have completed their training for Stephen Ministry. As I read your name, please come forward. Karen Essenavage. Susan Badorf. Jen Barrington. Diane Chandler, Myra Holmes, Cynthia Slater, Kathleen Kennan, and Tony Thurman. We'd like to acknowledge our two staff members, Kathleen and Tony, who have also taken this course, and they will be using their Stephen ministry skills within their ministry areas of our church. Friends, and you are friends, and we have become closer friends through this process. Friends, as God's Spirit has given each of you gifts for service, we call on you to use your gifts to help those in need. As you have been comforted by God's love, we call on you to serve God by extending compassion to those who need comforting. As God listens to you, we ask that you be a patient listener. As God cares for you, we ask that you help others through your own caring ministry. And now your questions for commissioning. With the help of God, are you willing to carry out this ministry of caring? Will you employ the skills you have learned to support, encourage, and comfort? And to our congregation, will you, the members of Westminster, be open to the ministry of our Stephen ministers, and will you pray for them that they may be effective servants of Christ? Will you? Will you accept their ministry when you need help and allow these individuals to work with you as you face struggles in your life? Will you? And we join together in the prayer that you'll find in your bulletin, praying, Eternal, Eternal God, God, we give, give thanks, thanks for, for the commitment, the commitment of, of these Stephen ministers, and we, and we pray that, that they will be faithful in their ministry of compassion. compassion. Strengthen them with the power of your Spirit, and guide them in the work they are called to do. May they, May they be quick to serve, patient in listening, and willing to share themselves with others. 
show them in times of stress and satisfaction a special measure of your joy and keep them strong in the faith you have given them. In Christ who cares for all of us in every way. Amen. You are now commissioned as Stephen ministers for this congregation. May God richly bless you and may you be a blessing to many others. Welcome to this special ministry. The Stephen leaders will now hand out their certificates and name badges. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and those only God loves, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>